Howdy. I'm running out of different ways to say hello for these types of videos, so if you have any suggestions, I could really use them. Um, but I'm super thankful that you have chosen to be with us tonight. Um, I, I pray that our time here tonight is an encouragement for you and for your families. Um, I pray that we would just learn from the Word of God, learn something that we can apply to our lives, and that we would just worship the God of the universe. The song that we're going to sing tonight is a song called Living Hope, and it is just a beautiful expression of the gospel. Um, from, from where we were before Christ to when God steps in and shows us mercy and to the hope that we have as Christians because of the resurrection. And Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's, that's what we rejoice in tonight. As the chorus of this song says, we ought to say, Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, our living hope. The prayer that I want to pray tonight is a prayer from the Puritans. Um, and, and the title of this prayer is called Evening Praise. Giver of all, Another day is ended, and I take my place beneath my great Redeemer's cross, where healing streams continually descend, where balm is poured into every wound, where I wash anew in, all the, in the all-cleansing blood, assured that you see in me no spots of sin. Yet a little while, and I shall go to your home and be no more seen. Help me to gird up the loins of my mind, to quicken my step, to speed as if each moment were my last, that my life be joy and my death be glory. Broken every chain, their 
there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. begin in prayer. Holy Father, your desire is that we desire you. Your will for our life is that our will be molded into yours, that we be reformed and conformed into the image of your Son, and that we glorify you in everything that we do by living the life that Christ commands. And I pray tonight that your word through the life of Judas here will come to us as a warning of what we can learn from his actions and how to stay away from the sin that so easily ensnared him. We thank you for your word. Guide us tonight by your Holy Spirit, and it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 26 of Acts chapter 1, but at first I'm just going to read verses 15 through 20. So the title of my lesson tonight is The Sin of Judas, and I want to discuss why it is that Judas betrayed Jesus and how we ourselves can guard against that same root sin. So I'm not saying that we're necessarily betraying Jesus, certainly not in the sense that Judas did, but we do want to learn from his grievous mistakes. And so tonight, we're going to discuss Judas, how he was the disciple, a betrayer, and his suicide, And we're going to discuss how it is that it applies to our life. So Judas is for sure one of the greatest villains in all 
of history. And it may seem odd that we are taking his life as some sort of biblical or spiritual reflection and looking at our own. But I think we can do something with what scripture gives us that can help us spiritually. So let me start it out like this. Have you ever wondered why Judas betrayed Jesus? I I mean, think about this for a moment. Everything that Judas saw from the baptism all the way through the teachings to the miracles to the individuals that were following him and being healed, everything that Jesus did, walking on water, everything. Have you ever wondered how is it that after seeing all of that, Judas would betray Jesus? What was going through his head? Now, certainly, and we're going to discuss this in just a moment, you may note, well, Satan had possessed Judas and Satan forced Judas to do that act, to betray Jesus. And though that's an interesting thought, I'm going to talk about that in a second and try to make sure that we put that in the proper context and the proper picture so that we understand fully what is going on here, or at least as much as we can so that we understand what's going on here with Judas. So, I want to address tonight's lesson by answering three questions regarding Judas's betrayal and how we ourselves can guard against that sin. Okay? So let me start by reading verses 15 through 20, and then I'll jump into my first question right off the bat. So again, Acts 1 starting at verse 15. Now, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. Now, you may be saying here at this point, well, wait a second, you know, Jesus appeared to like over 500 people after his resurrection. How come there's only 120? Well, we don't know if there's just that there's 120 with Peter at this time or in Jerusalem or what, We just know that in the presence of what is about to happen, there are 120 brothers. Verse 16, brothers, Peter says, The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. We'll talk more about that in just a second. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Verse 18. Now, this man acquired a fill with the reward of his wickedness. That's the 30 pieces of silver. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all of his bowels gushed out. It's graphic. It's disgusting. It's horrible. But I'm going to share with you in just a moment that I actually think not only is this a significant historical physical point, but this is also a theological point here. Verse 19 And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called, in their own language, a kildama. That is, field of blood. For it is written, again, this is Peter speaking, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. So we'll jump down to 21 and accordingly here in just a moment. But starting out with our first couple of questions, I think it's important that we just sort of take this passage in bite-sized chunks. So the first question that I want to do as we sort of do some biblical investigation here, that's kind of what we're doing. We're going to be a little biblical detectives, if you will, diving into the passage and searching for answers of these questions. The first question that I want to ask is this. What is the best explanation for Judas's betrayal? What is the best explanation for Judas betraying Jesus after everything he experienced and saw? Think about that for a second. So what I want to do here is I want to start out by listing the facts, what we know, before we start sort of conjecturing and see how that applies to our lives. 
Let's list what it is that we know about Judas and his betrayal. First of all, Judas was a disciple. And it appears that Judas was with Jesus all the way, and we'll note this in just a moment here, all the way from their baptism until he betrayed Jesus. Second, Judas saw Jesus perform many miracles and signs. He saw Jesus' baptism. In other words, so he heard the voice from heaven saying, God the Father saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He heard God saying that. And then he saw the Spirit, a Holy Spirit, descend upon Christ in the form of a dove. And so he had this verification that indeed Jesus was from God and indeed Jesus was the Son of God. For three years, it appears, that Judas was in the company of Jesus, the Messiah. Next, Judas was one of the 27, or excuse me, was one of the 72 that Jesus sent out to go village to village preaching about the kingdom of God. God. And in that time, we know that he went out and probably had a faithful, fruitful ministry, and there was nothing recorded in Scripture that would give anyone, at this time at least, any sort of hesitation to think that Judas was this villainous person. Next, this kind of goes with what I just said, none of the disciples assumed, as far as we know from Scripture, none of them assumed or knew Judas would eventually betray Jesus. I'll say more about this in just a moment. I think that's an important point. However, we get from the Last Supper when Jesus says that someone's going to betray him, that they're looking around and they have absolutely no idea that it is Judas. In fact, as far as we know, even when Judas leaves the company, they don't seem to register what's going on. The next fact Scripture never records that Judas was rebuked by Christ. So we never have this instance in Christ where Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, and he's speaking to Judas. That happens with Peter, but not Judas. As a matter of fact, we have every reason to believe that Jesus knew, and he did know, of Judas's betrayal, that it was coming, And yet still at the Last Supper, Jesus served Judas. So these are some strange facts. These are some things we need to take into account as we're doing our investigation here, okay? The next one, where are we on? I think the sixth one here. Judas took care of the money, and we know that he stole some of that money. So he was the treasurer here of the finances for the disciples, but he was pocketing some of that money. They evidently later found this out, that he was pocketing some of that money for his own personal use. Next, seven. Jesus, or excuse me, Judas betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. So we know how much it was that he used to buy the field that he would eventually hang himself in. 30 pieces of silver. And when he betrayed Christ, we know that he walked up to Christ, he kissed Christ, and he was wanting to give the money back eventually because he felt guilty or felt wrong or even said that you have you are convicting an innocent man. And, and at, at that, the, the, the high priest, or the, the, the um, um, religious leaders said, take your money, we don't want it. And then he would purchase this field later. Now, this is interesting here. Because what some may ask, and this is just sort of a historical puzzle piece, what some may ask is, why would Judas need to portray Jesus? What, why would the religious leaders need anyone to take them to Jesus? I mean, Jesus was out and about in Jerusalem every day here at this point. They saw him all the time. Why didn't they just arrest him when he was out and about doing his thing? Why didn't they arrest him when he was in the temple, cleansing the temple after he entered into Jerusalem? And the answer, I think with that, the best answer is, 
is that they didn't arrest him because if they would have arrested him in public when individuals were around listening to him, it is likely that they could have started a revolt from those that were listening to him and following him. They didn't want to start any sort of rebellion or revolt by his followers, so they wanted to take an opportunity when Jesus was off alone or at least with not many people around, in secret, and be led to him where he was in a secret place and arrest him there when there was really no major threat of a fight at that point. So the last fact that I have here, and there may be more, but these are kind of some that I'm thinking of here. The last fact is we know that Judas hung himself, and after he hangs himself, he falls and disembowels himself. Now you'll notice here in this passage in Acts, it says, verse 18, now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle of his bowels and gushed out. It doesn't say anything about Judas hanging himself here in Acts. We find that out in other passages. So is this a contradiction here? I don't think it is. I think Judas Probably the best explanation is is that when he hung himself, he didn't even do a good job there and perhaps didn't even kill himself in hanging himself. Or when he did, the limb broke or whatever it was that he was hanging himself from broke and he fell. And at that point, he disemboweled himself. Now, here's what I want to get to. What are some of the possible reasons for Judas's betrayal? I want to list out three possible reasons of his betrayal. Now, this is important, and I know you're thinking, well, Chad, is this some sort of historical survey? Are we in a Bible survey class? Are we we getting some sort of Bible lesson here tonight? We're, you're getting both. So just sit back, relax. Here we go. All right. Get you a glass of tea real quick if you need to. Hurry back, because here we go. The first possible reason that Judas betrayed Jesus is he did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. That's a possible reason. I don't like that reason. And I don't like that reason because it has some problems. First of all, there is no scriptural evidence indicating that Judas did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And again, we know that Judas stuck with Jesus for his three-year ministry. He saw many miracles. He saw many amazing events that Jesus performed And so we have every reason to believe that Judas thought Jesus was what he said he was, the Christ. That is the Greek term for the Messiah. And so Judas, along with the others, seemed to think that Jesus certainly was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah sent from God. So I don't buy the first possible reason. I don't think it's the best one. Next, number two. Judas was mad at Jesus. So the idea here is, is that somehow Jesus upset Judas. And we don't know how. I mean, you, you, we're going to have to speculate here of how, but maybe it's not recorded in Scripture, but, but Jesus called Judas out for some of his shrewd spending of the money that Jesus' ministry raised. Maybe it's something that Judas said or did. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Jesus has had a practice of calling a lot of his disciples out like we see with Peter, but it's usually only recorded with Peter in the rebuke. We don't know. But there's a problem here with Judas being mad at Jesus. Again, Scripture never records a problem between Jesus and Judas. And remember, again, no one ever suspected that Judas was the one that was going to betray Jesus. I mean, afterwards, it seems that the biblical authors are like, aha, of course, yes, he was stealing the money, etc. But they didn't seem to understand that at the time that it was actually happening. Even as I noted before, after Jesus pointed out that Judas would be the one to betray him. Who is it that's going to betray us? It's the one that he feeds. It was Judas, and they still didn't get what was going on there. So they didn't understand it. But we never read in Scripture that Judas was mad at Christ or that he was even rebuked by Christ. We read that Peter was rebuked. We read that James was rebuked. We read that John was rebuked, but never Judas. So we read of the disciples as a whole being rebuked, but never Judas individually. So I don't buy that second possible option here either. So I don't think that 
G Judas betrayed Jesus because he didn't think Jesus was Messiah, which would mean that Judas did think Jesus was Messiah. And I don't think it's number two either that Judas was mad at Jesus. I don't think he was mad at Jesus really per se, at least not in the sense that we would get of being mad at Jesus because Jesus got on to him or something like that. So here's the third reason. And I think the third reason may be the most likely reason for Judas to betray Jesus. And this isn't my own original reason. There are many commentators and biblical scholars that think this is a reason. But here's the one where I fall. Judas betrayed Jesus because he was trying to usher in the kingdom of Christ through his own means. In other words, Judas betrayed Jesus because he got mad that Jesus wasn't doing this stuff quickly enough. Judas got mad that Jesus wasn't hurrying up and speeding up the process of becoming the Messiah and running the Romans out and setting himself on the throne. Jesus, or rather, Judas was trying to force the mission of God. I think this is the best explanation of why G Judas would betray Christ. He was trying to make Christ establish an earthly ministry when Christ came to establish a heavenly ministry. In other words, Judas was trying to force the hand of Christ. See, we do know that Judas was certainly self-centered. We do know from Scripture that Judas was certainly a selfish individual. We do know that from Scripture that Judas certainly didn't think that Christ could get the job done or was going to get the job done in a way that Judas wanted him to. And we, then we know at the very end when Jesus was being arrested and be, beaten and it appears that he wasn't going to start taking over the kingdom, Judas throws the money back at the money or back at the religious leaders and says, you know, you've arrested an innocent man. The most likely explanation for all of those actions seems to be to me that at this point, some Judas realized that, wait a minute, Jesus either isn't the Messiah or he isn't going to set up an earthly kingdom like I thought he was. So all the disciples and every Jew at this time believed in some sort of Messiah to come. And they all believed that when the Messiah was going to come, that the Messiah would run the Romans out of town. No one assumed the Messiahship or the kingdom of Christ would be set up in the way that it was. They all assumed that he was going to run the Romans out of town, but that's not what happened. And Judas, trying to force the hand of Christ, took the soldiers out there, and was hoping at this point that the disciples of Christ and that Christ himself would defeat these religious leaders and then defeat the Romans and set up his kingdom. Now, granted, there is a possible problem with this in that how was Judas expecting to get away with this? How was he expecting to, if Christ is going to set up his kingdom, how was he expecting to be able to, I guess the, the way he is, get forgiven from this? For this act, perhaps he was just banking on the mercy of Christ. I don't know. But nonetheless, I would say that this is the best explanation given Judas's selfish, self-centered sin that we know he was dealing with. Let me move on to the second question here. How does Judas's sin affect us? How does Judas's sin affect us? Ultimately, Judas's sin is a sin that all of us deal with. In fact, from what I'm seeing here, ultimately, Judas's sin is the root of all sin, and that is selfishness. We all deal with selfishness. Judas became an enemy of God because he was unwilling to submit to the plans and the purpose of Christ. Judas became an enemy of God because he thought that his way was the best way, not Christ's. Judas became an enemy of God because he was trying to conform or mold the will of God to his will. That is selfishness. Judas's sin, Judas's sin is a sin we all deal with. And notice this. 
And again, verse 18, it says here that Judas fell and burst open in the middle and his bowels gushed out. I think that's significant theologically, not just graphically, physically here, historically, but I think it's significant theologically because I think here it indicates that what was truly inside of Judas, that selfishness, that self-centeredness eventually came out. And in the same way that what was inside of Judas when he hung himself and fell was clearly exposed, the selfishness that was inside of Judas came out at the betrayal of Jesus. Judas let his own selfishness fight against the will of God. And ultimately, that's what selfishness is. It is fighting against the will of God. But all along, and this is one of the significant parts about the sovereignty of God, as Judas is trying to manipulate the will of God, all along, Judas was actually playing into the very plan of God. Judas was fighting against the will of God, but God was using his selfishness to accomplish his plan, God's plan, that God had set in place before the foundations of the world were ever established. So God actually used his sin, the sin of Judas, to accomplish redemptive history, redemptive plan that had been established since before the foundations of the world. So what about you? Selfishness in your own life, because it's clear, I mean, we all know that selfishness is prevalent in human nature today. Selfishness is even prevalent in the church. People seeking their own self-interest in the church, people fighting in the church, people trying to bring disunity in the church, people trying to bring discord in the church. Selfishness is evident not only within the world, in the workplace, and at schools, but selfishness is evident even within the church itself. But generally, when we think of selfishness, we usually try to think of it in a prideful type sense. But in what way does selfishness generally manifest itself? Let me list some ways here that it possibly manifests. Uh, what are some indicators here of a selfish heart? The, one of the indicators that I have here of a selfish heart, and one of the reasons that I say that selfishness is the root of all sin, or pride is the root of all sin, is because one of the indicators is, is, is gossip. When you're gossiping about someone, ultimately you're gossiping about them because you think that you're better than them. And you want to somehow defame or dishonor or discredit their name, who they are, and hurt them so that people will think less of them and not you. So gossip is clearly an indication of selfishness. And we do gossip all the time, even in the church, right? And a lot of times, and I think Chuck has said this quite a bit, a lot of times we'll gossip with, I want to share a prayer concern I have with you, <laughs> right? I mean, we'll, we'll try to soup it up and dress it up as some sort of spiritual concern, but in reality, when you dig underneath that shallow surface, you find that that concern is actually hollow and filled with pride. So gossip's one. A negative spirit is another. If you are a type of individual that is always complaining about people or others or things, like you can never be content. One of the words that I use a lot with this is you're implacable. No one can ever satisfy you. Nothing is ever right. Your food's never right. People never treat you right, whatever. That negative spirit is actually a sign of your selfishness. No one can ever please you. No one can ever do what you want. No one's ever good enough. No one, you never give any sort of encouragement. You're always hurting people. You're always belittling people. And see, in the back of your mind, you may be thinking, I'm doing them a favor because they're just messed up. I want to set them straight. But really, that's a negative spirit that's being, uh, that's just really, that's selfishness and pride manifesting itself rather in a negative spirit. And the other extreme here of that is apathy, indifference. That's also selfishness. It's kind of like the, the teenage statement, right, that we all hear at times. Whatever. I mean, that's, that's pride. I don't care what they think about me. I don't care about church. I don't care about God. I don't care about those people. I don't care about my neighbors. 
I don't care about this. I don't care about that. Whatever. Who cares? Just forget you guys. That indifference, it may sound like you're sort of level-headed and have some sort of healthy self-confidence, but actually what that is, is just pride in thinking that you're better than anybody else and no one can please you and no one can do what's right for you and you just don't care because you're trying to deal with this sin in your own life thinking that you're better than anyone else. Another way that selfishness A selfish heart manifests itself is a lack of focus on the mission of God. If you're only focused on earthly things and pleasing yourself, you're not going to be focused on the mission of God. Another way that selfishness manifests itself that I see quite a bit is fighting pointless battles. Fighting over stupid, pointless things that don't matter a hill of beans. Get it on social media. This is generally what you'll see on social media or just in the general husband-wife relationship, right? Fighting over some of the dumbest things in the world. I mean, it can be as superficial and silly as they don't put the toothpaste cap back on the toothpaste. Or it could be something as silly as, you know, they, they don't, they put their elbows on the table or whatever. These pointless battles that we fight sometimes because it just... It just grades against our pride, and we have to say something. Again, that's just a selfish heart coming out, manifesting itself. You're not thinking of others before yourself. You're not caring about others before yourself. You really care about you and what you want and what you think. Let me give you an illustration here of what I'm talking about from our own contemporary setting. You will remember, I'm sure, because it was all over the news, when COVID-19 really started kicking off and many of the states started implying, or or not implying, it started uh, mandating certain sort of shelter in place or stay at home or social distancing rules. And there were tons of college students that went to the beach at that time, right? And many camera crews went down to the college students on the beach and interviewed them as to why they are ignoring the social distancing and the stay-at-home orders. And one specific interview was from a college student that said something like this. Hey, we're just living for ourselves right now and doing what we want to do. This is for us right now, not for anybody else. (laughs) Now, clearly, that is a picture-perfect manifestation of selfishness. But... Ultimately, what selfishness does is, is it distorts reality in our own head. It doesn't help us see reason. It doesn't help us see things as they actually are. And Judas, because he thought that he could usher in the kingdom of God, speed it up. He didn't want to see reality. And so he was willing to betray the son of God, the Messiah himself, so that he could try to mold the will of God to his will. So the third question that I want to address, and in addressing this question, I need to read the rest of the passage here. How do we protect from fighting against God's will? Well, the first way that I think we can fight against it is listed right here in verses 1 through 26. And I want to draw out actually four ways, rather, that we can fight against or protect against fighting against God's will. The first way here is notice in verse 20, actually, for it is written, Peter says, in the book book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. 21. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these men must come with us. So Peter is saying here that scripture indicates that he must follow the will of God by doing what scripture says. Or or I guess I should say it like this. Scripture indicates what it is that they must do to obey and follow the will of God. So the first way that we protect against fighting against the will of God is obey Scripture, follow Scripture, do what Scripture says. As a matter of fact, I think most of us would understand that if we want to obey the will of God, because the Bible is the Word of God, we do what the Bible says. 
So the first way that we protect here against following selfishness or fighting against the will of God is obey Scripture. Follow what God says in Scripture. And then the next one here, look at verse 20, 22. But from the beginning of the John's baptism until the day he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to the resurrection. And they put forward, they being, we're assuming either the 120 or just the 11 apostles. We don't know. We're not sure. It's probably most likely all of the 120 that are with them. But nonetheless, notice they, the community that's there with him, the community put forward too. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. So they put forward, the community put forward two individuals, Justice and Matthias. So another way that we can protect against from or protect from fighting against God's will is is seek guidance and accountability from a community of believers. In other words, be connected to followers of Christ, the community. So a community of brothers and sisters is also a great way to help keep us accountable, to help keep us spiritually in line, and to help us grow in our faith. I got to move through these quickly. Third, and verse 24, and they prayed. So that's the next, the next thing that I note here. Next way that we can protect against disobeying God's will is pray. The believers here pray and ask that God will guide them. So prayer is also another tool that we have to make sure that we are in the will and following the will of God. And then lastly, and they prayed, verse 24, and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, this whole casting lots business, let's talk about this before I hammer down here on the last thing we can do. This idea here of casting lots for either Justice or Matthias. Here's the deal. I don't think that we should start casting lots in the church. I don't think that needs to be a church practice. But I think probably one of the best explanations here is this. Is that both in the mind of all the brothers that brought forward Justice and Matthias, both were equally viable options to replace Judas. They didn't know which one was best or which one God chose, but here's two, God. They seem in our eyes to each be equally viable, and they cast lots to find which one it was that God wanted them. So it wasn't necessarily that one was better than the other per se. It was just simply which one does God want. And so that brings me to my fourth way here that we can protect against fighting against God's will, and that is seek the guidance of God. God. Seek, in other words, probably the best way of saying it, seek, really seek the will of God. I don't mean act like you seek the will of God. I don't mean apathetically seek the will of God. I don't mean try to mold the will of God to your will. I mean have the heart and mind, the spiritual disposition where you are willing to say, God truly Honestly, what is your will in this situation? I don't want to fight against your will. Those are four ways that we can help protect against the selfishness in our own heart that may do damage to the will of God. So what, why was it that Judas betrayed Jesus? Ultimately, it was the selfishness in his own heart that tried to, that rather led him to try to force the hand of Christ to speed up the process of the coming of the kingdom. Second, the second question here is, is how can we learn from that? What can we learn? We can learn that we need to be careful with selfishness in our own heart, in our own mind, and understand that that selfishness is indicated by various different ways. And then last, and I'm closing with this, how is it that we protect from allowing the selfishness in our heart to hurt against the will of God, or rather to fight against the will of God, 
We do that by seeking scripture guidance, by seeking the guidance of the community of believers, by seeking God's guidance in prayer, and by truly and honestly seeking the Father's 